The bitter struggle between Arab and Jew for control of the Holy Land has caused untold suffering in the Middle East for generations. It is often claimed that the crisis originated with Jewish emigration to Palestine and the foundation of the State of Israel. Yet the roots of the conflict are to be found much earlier, in British double-dealing during the First World War. This is a story of intrigue among rival empires, of misguided strategies, and of how conflicting promises to Arab and Jew created a legacy of bloodshed which has determined the fate of the Middle East. During the First World War, the British, the French, and the Russians had these secret plans to carve up the Ottoman Empire because they believed that would balance out their imperial ambitions, but tough luck for the Turks, the Arabs, and anyone else who got in the way. Certainly, all the seeds were planted then, in the sense that it was the British who promised the Arabs independence on the one hand, and uh, a Jewish homeland on the other, and you could not simply reconcile one with the other. The British scattered promises to anyone who might be of some use to them without thinking about the consequences. So British duplicity, British double dealing, went a long way to perpetuate the conflict in Palestine. At the end of the day, when you're fighting a war, you are very liberal in what you're offering in terms of a post-war settlement. And when you get down to the conference table when the war has ended and you have to start honoring your agreements, you then have to decide what's in your interest or not. And the British saw the Middle East as a Western flank for their power in India and their power in Asia in general. The story of Britain's involvement in the Middle East and the ensuing struggle between Arab and Jew begins with her colonial past. At the beginning of the 20th century, King Edward VII ruled over a vast empire with interests in every part of the world. India became increasingly important because uh, it was the second pillar of British power in the world. Moving the Indian army about was extremely important in extending British interests and British influence across the globe. And the Suez Canal was, of course, the quick way to do that. It's very important for the British uh, geopolitical position to ensure the Suez Canal remains safe and secure. With this aim in mind, Britain had become the only European power to establish a major foothold in the Middle East, in the principalities around the Persian Gulf, in Aden and in Egypt. Britain had annexed Egypt from Turkey's Ottoman Empire in 1882. And by the time it was made a protectorate in 1914, Cairo had become the center of British power in the Middle East. The presence of imperial troops in the region was of vital strategic importance. For the Ottoman Empire under Sultan Mohammed V was in alliance with Britain's much feared rival, Germany. Together with the Austro-Hungarian Empire, these countries made up the Central Powers, and pitted against them were the three allies, Britain, France, and Russia. From the Ottoman capital, Constantinople in Turkey, the Sultan ruled over the last of the great Islamic empires. It had been an almost terminal decline for decades. Yet the fate of the Ottoman Empire was to be sealed by the outbreak of the First World War in August 1914. In Europe, Germany's rapid advance was halted by Britain and France along the Western Front. In the East, Russia's war against Germany and Austria-Hungary also reached deadlock. The powerful weapons of the Industrial Age were killing thousands of men in the trenches of every army. All of the leading powers expected the war to be over within a matter of months. 
So in that sense, all of them are surprised at the end of 1914, when not merely is the war going on, but it shows every sign of being likely to go on for a very long time. At that point, they begin to think about new ways of winning the war. Britain's Prime Minister Asquith felt that with the stalemate in Europe, it was essential to widen the conflict. Together with Foreign Secretary Lord Grey, Minister for War Lord Kitchener, and the First Lord of the Admiralty Winston Churchill, they masterminded a complex strategy to undermine the Central Powers. This was a global war, and the British saw the Middle East very much in a global context. The traditional British preference for sideshows, as people um, unfavorably call it, the, the indirect strategy, the way of uh, attacking the soft underbelly, as Churchill called it, uh, of the enemy. And the soft underbelly was seen to be Turkey. Britain's secret plan involved, on the one hand, a military diversion, and on the other, a devious use of diplomacy through bribery, subversion, and double dealing. All these devices focused on the enemy's weakest link, Turkey's Ottoman Empire. Diplomacy in general has always had a secret dimension to it, whether, where, but where discretion ends and conspiracy begins is an open question. But during the period bef up to and during the First World War, there was a particularly intense set of negotiations and discussions between the major imperial powers, between the French, the Russians, and the British in particular, cutting in the Italians as well, about what would they do when the war was over and when the Ottoman Empire broke up. The British government hoped that by striking a deal over the spoils of war, it would strengthen the alliance against the Central Powers. Amongst the Allies, Russia had long sought access to the Mediterranean. In a secret treaty of March 1915, Britain and France offered what was to the Tsar a prize of vital geopolitical importance, Constantinople. It is that key outlet into the wider world and into the Mediterranean. And it is the one thing, of course, the British and the French have been attempting to prevent the Russians from achieving. So this is a complete volte face. This is, this is the British, the French, and the Russians coming to an agreement over something which was, up to this point, almost inconceivable. Italy's King Vittorio Emmanuel was another target for bribery. Britain, France, and Russia tried to tempt Italy, a pro-German state, to join the Allies. In April 1915, a secret treaty offered Italy a substantial bit of Ottoman real estate in Anatolia. Again, it's another power coming into the equation and being offered territorial advancement, which in normal circumstances would have been quite inconceivable. The bribe worked. Italy joined the Allies and declared war on the Central Powers in August 1915. But Britain's strategy to undermine the enemy via the Ottoman Empire also required subversion. By using domestic opposition to weaken, maybe even destroy it, Britain exploited a new movement sweeping through the empire, nationalism. Nationalism in the sense of believing that there are peoples with a clear cultural identity and that these people should have independent. That idea spread to the Middle East as to other parts of the world in the latter part of the 19th century. So you had the beginnings in the Ottoman Empire of a Turkish nationalism. This came to a head when the young Turks took power in a coup in 1908 and started to impose their language and culture on the Arabs of the empire. But this only reawakened an interest amongst Arabs in their own heritage. A thousand years before, Arabs had brought the technology and literature of the East to the West, and their religion, Islam, had encompassed much of Asia, North Africa, and Southwestern Europe. The idea of recovering that historic grandeur had remained in the consciousness of Arab intellectuals. 
By the start of the First World War, the antagonism between Arab and Turk had increased. The very fact that the Turks were saying, we want to have a unified empire, meant the Arabs said, wait a minute, we're not part of this. So all of this literary and nationalistic revival then took a much more political form, and therefore you got the emergence of Arab nationalism. They had arrived at the conclusion that remaining in the Ottoman Empire was becoming hopeless, that they couldn't actually share power with the Turks. And they began thinking of having their own state. By the summer of 1915, British intelligence confirmed that the Arab nationalist movement was the breakthrough the government was looking for. Britain and her French ally dispatched officers to sound out Arab leaders. Both the French and the British started, you could say, seducing various local Arab leaders that if you side with us, we'll give you your independence. So why don't you leave the Ottomans? And various people were tempted as a result. If they, they thought they could actually gain independence, why not? side with the Europeans against the Ottomans. The idea was to tempt the Arabs into a revolt against their Ottoman overlords and create a diversion which would tie down the central powers in the Middle East. Ironically, the impetus for such a diversion had come not from London, but from the Arab world. In the Hejaz, in Western Arabia, Sheriff Hussein, its ruler, was set on extending his political and geographical domain. He believed he might be able to do it with the help of the British. In turn, the British were impressed by Sheriff Hussein's family credentials as custodians of the holy places of Islam. They call themselves Hashemites. They call the family Hashemites because that's the family or the tribe of the Prophet Muhammad. They were the Bani Hashem, the sons of Hashem. So he was, Sharif Hussein was the leader of the Hashemites. He was the person responsible for Mecca and Medina. And although he had worked with the Ottomans before the First World War, once the First World War happened, he saw this was his chance. A chance too for the British, who saw support for Sharif Hussein as a way to threaten the Sultan's hold on the Caliphate, the political leadership of the Islamic world. The British, because they were fighting the Ottomans and the Ottomans were claiming to be the real representatives of Islam, they wanted a counterforce. And the counterforce was represented by Sharif Hussein, being a descendant of the Prophet. But Sharif Hussein was speaking of liberating Arab lands, building a new national state. He wanted to be king of the Arabs, not simply of Arabians. In July 1915, Sharif Hussein smuggled a message to the British High Commissioner in Cairo, Sir Henry McMahon offering to raise a substantial Arab force against the Ottomans in return for British support for Arab independence. In the ensuing secret correspondence between the two men, Sharif Hussein was given to understand that he could expect British support in achieving some of his ambitions in the event of an Ottoman defeat. This letter of October the 26th, 1915, outlined the main points of the arrangement. The actual document itself is absolutely riven with ambiguity. There's no doubt about that. The question is whether Hussein recognizes that. My sense of Hussein is that he does recognize it. In other words, there is no wool being poured over his eyes because he's perfectly aware that if he's going to create a modern Arab empire, he's going to need some logistical, economic development, and that can only come from the outside world. Taking Britain's assurances of support at face value, Hussein, together with his sons Faisal and Abdullah, amassed a sizable force. The new army was commanded by the young and charismatic Faisal, who had captured the imagination of the Arab masses in the quest for Arab independence. Yet even as Hussein and Faisal mobilized their troops, the British were preparing to sell them short. 
Back in London, in the spring of 1916, Britain was negotiating with France about the future shape of the Middle East. Behind closed doors, Sir Mark Sykes of the British Foreign Office had been meeting his French opposite number, Francois-Georges Picot. Britain knew it was vital to offer the French a stake in the spoils of the Ottoman Empire should they win the war. There was an awareness on the British side that they had made such huge sacrifices that one couldn't just ignore um, French ambitions and that the French were determined to have their historical piece of the Levant. Poring over a map of the Levant, Sykes and Pico personally drew in the areas they wished to see under their control. Their secret deal amounted to the virtual carve-up of the Middle East. In Area A for the French and Area B for the British, the imperialists intended to exercise power indirectly. They would appoint advisers and take charge of the finances in their respective spheres of influence. Then there was the area coloured blue, which was to be directly controlled by France. This included what was then known as Greater Syria, where the French traditionally had commercial and religious interests. As for the area coloured pink, known as Iraq, with its strategic ports, railways and oil, this was to be under British rule. The area coloured yellow represented Palestine and was envisaged as an international zone, except for Haifa. Uh, 